My governing principle, I think I've probably said it too many times, but I'll say it again. Rates are going to be higher than we like, and they'll stay here longer than we want. So if you use that as a principle, whenever the consensus thinks we're done, it's been pretty profitable to be on the other side of consensus. And so I still kind of maintain that we're probably going to have a 5.5% Fed funds rate, which means that, I don't know, maybe Credit Suisse will offer me 7.5% soon on three-month T-bills, but we're going to have higher rates. And I do think Brad's right, though, in the sense that as long as we know that then that's it and we can forecast it into the future without it changing too much, it'll be okay. But right now, what you're seeing is a lot of make-believe going on in in the stock market. Jamath Palihapitiya is best known for his contrarian viewpoints on markets and going against traditional investing views, and he has made billions in doing so. In his latest stolen podcast, he shares his thoughts on the current macro environment and the uncertainty that is currently plaguing the markets. Chamath believes that markets are still completely disconnected with reality and that another leg down for markets is the most likely probable scenario. Also, only a small percentage of my viewers are actually subscribed. If you enjoy finance content, consider subscribing or liking the video. It's free and you can always change your mind. So Nick, if you want to just throw up that image. So this is something that I saw in Bloomberg, which I thought was really interesting. And if you focus on the period of 2020 to 2024, what you see is the white line, which is net income adjusted for depreciation and amortization. And the blue line is cash flows from operations. So what does that mean? And the white line is what you tell Wall Street in terms of what you make on paper. The blue line is what actually appears in the bank account. So why could there be a gap between what you tell somebody you made, I made a dollar, versus what's in the bank, 50 cents. Well, the reason is that there's all kinds of accounting tricks that you can use, accruals, inventories, and all of these things allow you to present a healthier earnings report than is actually true. And so right now, we have the worst earnings situation, so the worst gap between what we are telling people versus what is actually in the bank account that we've had for 30 years, since 1990. And so it just brings into focus the fact that we may be in the last few innings of trying to make sure this all looks okay, in which case one faction of the investing world who thinks that this earnings recession is actually at hand would be kind of right. And then what they would say is that once we all realize that these earnings are fake and you reset down 15%, that's where you get to the mid 3000 in, in the S&P 500. Right now it's around 4000. I don't know if that's true or not, but there's more and more evidence that would support that the way that they see the world could be credible. The other side says, hey, listen, this is a bump in the road. We're getting a handle on things and it's stabilizing. So even though it's higher than we'd like, it's not going to change that much. So now just think about 10, 15 years from now and let's go. And those How are the does, folks yeah. that want to rip the money into growth stocks and tech stocks again. Stimulus is still entering the economy. It's just harder to measure. So for example, take Social Security. You have cost of living adjustments in Social Security that's lifting payments by 10 and 15% because it's backdated for what was going on last year. And remember last year, we had two, three, four, five percent inflation rates. So there is more and more money coming into people's pockets that we don't realize. And we're all on the hook for that as US taxpayers. So I think it's very dangerous to kind of look at one data point and try to pick off what's happening in consumer land, because there's all kinds of hidden ways in which money gets back to people. Brad, you have thoughts on the consumer because, you know, uh, I test, it does seem like consumers are still mon spending money, but the cost of goods in some cases is coming down. I mean, how do you look at the consumer and try to make sense of what's going on here? Because it does seem the United States is in its own little bubble here world of just overemployment. Still, even though we're seeing these layoffs in tech. Well, the, uh, I would say, number one, uh, that the pop we've seen in rates, which impacts consumers by way of higher mortgages, higher variable expenses on their credit cards was offset over the last few months by lower energy costs. So their cost of gasoline went down. Add in the things that Chamath's talking about, and I'm not sure you took a lot of money out of people's pockets. I would say this, that again, what we're talking about here, retail sales have continued to do really well. E-commerce sales in January were quite strong. That would all be consistent with the soft landing. But here we are, you know, again, talking about macro, I think when you spend this much time talking about macro doing what we do, you know, like last year, I'll be the first to raise my hand and say, you know, like our friend Bill Gurley would say, it leads you in the wrong direction. The fact of the, no 
matter is it's totally unknown and unknowable where we're going to go over the course of the next three or four months. I think there's a better ability to predict maybe over the course of the next couple of years. But the fact is, if you would have told any, I was just with a bunch of uh, investors who probably represent a trillion dollars of public market demand, 10 or so long only investors. If you would have told any of them that the 10 year was going to be at 396, they would have told you that the NASDAQ would be down 10% to start the year. And it did just the opposite. So I think you got you have a much better chance, particularly if you're playing at home, than trying to, to guess the direction of that. Find five companies that you think are going to grow uh, and earn more money, irrespective of the direction of rates and inflation, own those uh, and enjoy your life. I'm looking at the world and going, Sachs, my Lord, I'm seeing great founders, great companies, and five to $10 million valuations. And I can buy five, 10, 15% of these companies. Uh, this feels like the best uh, it's been for me as an angel investor, seed investor, or seed fund for a long time. This is fantastic. Uh, great deal flow. The deals are taking six weeks to close. We're having very thoughtful discussions. People are taking a real focused approach to how they deploy the capital. It is not YOLO. People are building models again. People are showing their CAC. They're being thoughtful about how they spend the money. They're being thoughtful about salaries and hiring. So what, what's your, you seem to think that, you know, what we're seeing here is challenging or a problem. What are your thoughts on how it's affecting your day-to-day -day business? as somebody who is a company builder? Well, let's separate two things. Yeah. So there's the tech ecosystem and then there's the economy as a whole. The fact of the matter is that tech already had its bubble in 2021. It had its crash in 2022. And now we're largely on the other side of that. There's still a lot of companies like we talked about that are going to need to restructure who raised during the bubble and may not have come to grips with that. But if you're talking about new investment, new rounds, new companies that are starting with a clean sheet of paper and a blank slate, you're right. Things seem good and normal, right? People are making intelligent investments. And obviously, the innovation cycle doesn't have anything to do with the macro picture. I mean, technology wants to evolve. And it's great engineers and product people who drive those ideas forward. And they're not thinking about interest rates. I never thought about the Fed funds rate at all when I was a founder running companies. So let's just put that aside and acknowledge that so great innovation is going to keep happening no matter what the macroeconomic picture looks like. That being said, I mean, just for the you know listeners of the show who aren't startup founders, I tend to be a little bit gloomy about the macro picture right now because, yeah, it's true that what Brad said, that we've had good economies with 5% rates before, but I think you also have to look at the pace of change or the rate at which the, the Fed funds rate has been going up. And if you look at the chart of rate increases, it is a very steep chart of rate increases. And I just think that for the last decade or so, we've been operating in this like zero interest rate or, or ZERP environment with lots of monetary stimulus. And I think a lot of companies, a lot of parts of the economy got addicted to that stimulus. They got hooked on drugs. Now, all of a sudden, you're putting them through withdrawal very, very quickly. And obviously, the withdrawal pangs are going to be worse if you can't taper off slowly. So, it looked like just a few weeks ago that the Fed was done raising rates. Now we know that they're not. We don't really know when they're going to stop. So I tend to be a little bit gloomy with respect to the the big macro picture because I just don't see how you can change rates this fast. And not, I mean, you look at like real estate, for example. We just saw the first year over year decrease in the housing market in a while. And again, that's all driven by rates, the cost of mortgages going up. So I, I think that there's going to be some pain ahead. Now, you know, ironically, from the standpoint of the tech ecosystem, we may have already taken our medicine. Maybe that's the segue to talking about Benioff. I would say we haven't took it. We're taking it. We're starting to take our medicine. 